press record because we are recording today. And I know that the slides uh, for this will be shared afterwards. So we've got some wonderful people speaking today and I'm gonna go ahead and turn things over to Mary Rauner. Thanks so much, Laura. So my name is Mary Rauner and I'm with the Regional Education Laboratory West at West Ed. Uh, we're really glad you're here and we're excited for this discussion. It's, as Laura mentioned, a little bit of a small group today. So you'll see in the slides that we planned on some breakout sessions, but I'm actually really looking forward to a smaller group with more opportunity for discussion. So I'm here with my colleagues, Francis Reed and Laura Buckner, and we're from West Ed and our partners at the Centers of Excellence for Labor Market Research, Michael Goss, Nora Serenello, Nora Serenello and Sarah Phillips. So during our time together, we're first gonna review the findings from our recent study that analyzes the relationship between middle skill occupational supply and demand for all of rural California. And then we'll dig into data for the CVML South subregion. And finally, we'll discuss the landscape shifts that we've seen due to COVID-19, some of the barriers to meeting the occupational demand in your area, and hear from each other about strategies for overcoming those barriers. We hope that we'll all come away today with kind of new understandings, insights, and strategies, as well as some action plans to collaborate regionally to strengthen the middle skill workforce. I mentioned that our work is part of the Regional Education Laboratory West or REL West at West Ed. We're one of 10 regional labs in the country funded by the Institute of Education Sciences at the Department of Education. REL West's goal is to promote the use of data and research evidence to inform policy and practice and ultimately improve academic outcomes for students. Now within REL West, this project is part of the California Rural Partnerships Alliance. Over the course of the project, we've provided coaching to several cross-sector rural California consortia um, to support their use of data to strengthen education and career pathways. We also conducted the study that we're gonna to discuss today, and we were really pleased to partner with the Centers of Excellence um, on the study. Michael Goss, who's here with us today, was the key researcher. So I'm gonna turn it over to him to share the study findings with you. Now, Michael is the Centers of Excellence Director of the Inland Empire and Desert, and he has over 10 years of labor market work experience and also serves on the US Bureau of Labor Statistics Data User Advisory Committee and the Southern California Association of Governments Global Land Use and Economic Council. Thanks for being here, Michael. Thank you so much for that introduction, Mary. And thank you for having me here today to speak about the Central Valley Motherlode South region. So um, as Mary mentioned, I do represent the, uh, the Inland Empire Desert region, which is inland Southern California. Um, however, um, while we're well known as the, as the sprawl for our larger Los Angeles, Orange and San Diego counties, 20% um, of our population does reside in areas in the desert areas, which is considered rural. So we do everything we can to tell their story and make sure that their needs are not lost in the, in the, in the data story. And um, also as very Mary mentioned, I'm joined by my colleagues, Nora, uh, Nora Serenello, who you, who you definitely know, and, um, and Sarah Phillips, who represents the North Far North region. So um, during the pandemic, we saw that um, many stories about how um, people are moving out of the urban areas and into the uh, more rural areas so they can find uh, more elbow space. Uh, there was a great story in the LA Times recently but that, that named Fresno, uh, which is in this particular area, as the hottest, uh, the hottest housing market within the, the nation right now. Um, again, it's, uh, it may not necessarily be more affordable, but it definitely gave people more elbow space um, as we were stuck at home. So the goal of this study was twofold. The goal of the study was twofold. It was really to document the types of jobs that were available in these rural areas and look at demand with the, by the number of annual job openings and look at the entry level wages for these occupations. And also to inventory the, all the post-secondary programs that were available to train these programs in the region. 
So when we looked at a, a map, we identified all the areas that were rural within California, and I'll speak more to that in a moment. But particularly, we're focusing today on the Central Valley Mother North, which is represented by the orange colored area within this map. Uh, it represents 6.8% of California's total population. And over the next five years, or sorry, <laughs> between the uh, study period, which is 2017 to 2020, it was expected to increase, increase by 3.3% and add 90,000 residents during that time. So the first thing we did is we looked at the supply side data. So the source for our supply side data was the uh, was IPEDS, the federal, federal um, IPEDS data. And that looked at all post-secondary institutions that participate in federal student financial aid programs, including universities, college, technical, and vocational institutions. Uh, within this particular area, we saw 10 California community colleges and 17 for-profit institutions housing 103,000 students. Um, and we looked at all awards, all middle skill type awards that um, are basically associate's degrees that were generally between four, two and four years uh, for a full-time equivalent student. And we looked at all post-secondary awards and certificates uh, that were at least two years, but less than four years, one year, two years, and those less than one year. And IPEDS reports all uh, credentials awarded uh, by these institutions, not necessarily the number of students receiving the awards. So the next thing we looked at was we looked at the labor market data. And particularly, we looked at middle skill jobs. Middle skill jobs are generally those jobs that require more than a high school diploma, but less than a bachelor's degree. So this includes all certificates and associate's degrees. Uh, we expanded to the, to the COE method. We also looked at occupations that um, generally require, uh, as a state requirement, are acceptable to have a community college um, degree, such as a nurse, registered nurse is a great example of this. Um, at the federal level, they say registered nurses need a bachelor's degree, but we know at the state, they need, um, they need at least an associate's degree plus some other credentialing to enter employment. And we looked at high school diplomas that are, we looked at occupations that require high school diplomas that also require um, some kind of certification to enter employment, which could be handled by our California community college system. Uh, within the Central Valley Mother Load South, 34% of all the jobs in, that, in this particular subregion were middle skill, and they're expected to have 42,000 annual job openings during the projection period. And annual job openings are those jobs, um, what annual job openings are is, is it's new job growth and also jobs that are available because uh, a worker vacates a position, such as a uh, good example is retirement, they may transfer out to another region for work or they may transfer to a, um, a management position, for example, a promotion. And then we looked at the earnings for these occupations. We looked at them at different percentiles. We looked at the 25th percentile, which we call an entry-level wage, because when a person enters an occupation, we assume that they enter at the low end of the scale and they'll work their way up over time. We looked at the median, which is the 50th percentile. And we also looked at the 75th percentile, which we called in this report an experience wage, assuming again that people will work up over time to a higher wage in their occupation. Uh, to, to create a baseline for, um, for self-sustainability, we use the MIT living wage calculator, and we looked at the highest wage in all the counties uh, combined that, for the analysis. So at the time of the study, that, that MIT living wage, uh, living wage calculator said the, the living wage was $12.19 an hour, but we looked at it again for the study, and it is currently $16.31 in, um, in one of the counties. Uh, and we'll talk more about the living wage momentarily. So what we did for the study is we looked at all those uh, occupations. We looked at the programs. So we basically did a, um, an occupation to educational program match. Um, and we used the method developed by the Bureau of Labor Statistics and the National Center of Educational Statistics that created a, a, um, a matching system between these two systems so we can look at the types of programs, um, the program of study, and how they relate to the knowledge, skills, and abilities needed for occupations. So what we found overall, when we looked at all four of these rural subregions within the state, we found that 70% of these occupations had a positive job growth, meaning that they were expected to expand employment over time. 
new job employment over time. And we found that 79% paid a living wage. Uh, so that ex in, in this particular study, in this area, they exceeded $12.28 per hour at the entry level um, wage. And we use the, li the living wage calculator for that. So overall, we found that there was gonna be 84,000 uh, job openings in these rural areas, 31% of all job, job openings in the, in the four rural regions. And we found that there were just over 20,000 credentials awarded for these, these occupations. Meaning that if we look at it in a visual display, we see that, you know, <laughs> no problem. I know there's a delay. We saw that there was basically um, a gap of 60, sorry, 76 percent uh, gap in training so that there was more annual job openings than there was potentially credential uh, people to fill these jobs. So that that presented a big opportunity to look further at these occupations and determine where we can expand um, program offerings within these areas so we can meet the needs of local employers. So there was, there was a big opportunity in these rural areas to expand. So now we'll do a breakout session where we can uh, just, are we doing the breakout, Mary? Nope. Oh, no breakout. Well, what we're gonna do is just <laughs> um, do it as a broader group and sure. briefly, um, you know, just describe, just um, introduce yourself. Um, Tell us your interest in align, aligning education and careers in your region. And then, you know, are, were there any questions that you had about the data you received in advance of the meeting or any predictions about um, what you expect to see? So um, I think that um, Michael and Francis and Laura and I won't necessarily um, participate in this except to say, because we've already introduced ourselves, but we're eager to hear from you about your interests and your thoughts or quick questions um, from the outset. So um, why don't I just call on people to make it a little bit easier. Sarah, do you wanna go or do you wanna hold off on this one? Sure, hi everyone. I'm really happy to join you here. I think that this is a really important research study, especially the focus on rural areas. I represent a very rural region. Um, I always appreciate any focus and talk, conversation we can have about um, data in this rural area or our rural areas. So I am, like Michael said earlier, I am the director of the Far North Center of Excellence. I represent the 15 counties and then like, just think about Sacramento and then go north. And um, there's seven community colleges up here and that's where I'm, uh, who I represent, and I'm hosted at Shasta College, which is based in Reading. I'm looking forward to hearing your conversation today. Thanks, Sarah. Karina, do you want to go next? Sure, I'm the exact opposite of Sarah. I am the pathway coordinator for the West Kern Community College District, so I'm all the way down at Bakersfield and then southwest oh. of Bakersfield. So I'm also <laughs> representing a rural area in in my little community of Taft and Maricopa and Bell Ridge. So um, I was just wanting to get some of this information also because uh, we face different challenges than, than some of the other areas do. So uh, we're just kind of out here in the middle of God's desert and, <laughs> and this is great. So thank you. Thanks, Karina. David. Uh, hi, I'm Dave Teasdale. I'm the Executive Director of Economic and Workforce Development Programs, and I also serve as the Regional Director for Energy Construction and Utilities for the Central and South Central Coast region. And I'm always looking for uh, more data about labor market, and uh, I enjoyed your, uh, your presentation for the Northern area, and I just wanted to see what differences we saw in the South. Thank you. Um, Gary? Hello everyone, my name is Gary Potter. I'm the Regional Director for Advanced Manufacturing for the Central Valley Middle Road Region. Uh, just here to get some, some data and some insight of uh, future trends. Thanks, Gary. Nora, do you want to say a quick hello too? Sure. Um, I'm Nora Serenello. Most of you know me. Um, I'm the Director for the Central Valley uh, Mother Load Center of Excellence, and I am always happy to get data in front of people like Sarah and wanting to talk about data and most importantly hearing from you all 
uh, getting your perspectives on what's happening locally and in our region. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll move forward now. And um, Michael's going to um, go through now the more detailed data for your region. Um, I'll mute myself, Michael. Yep. Go ahead. Thank you so much, Mary. Uh, just my notes up here. So if you have any questions about the sub area, just go ahead and post them down in the chat and we'll we'll answer them at the end of the um, at the end of this session. So we did look at the Central Valley Motherlode South area. So um, how we defined rule, uh, we looked at the definition that was provided by the Federal Office of Management and Budget uh, and pulled the, their rule definitions. So we looked at those counties. And then to further break apart um, the, the Northern Central Valley from the Southern Central Valley, uh, we got advice from the, um, the Center for Business and Policy Research at the University of the Pacific. And I also talked to my, my wonderful former colleagues at the California Labor Market Information Division, you may know them as well, uh, Nadia Martinez and Steven Gutierrez on um, how these regions are broken apart, looking at commuting patterns to ensure that we're making a um, at least a clean break as possible from the north and the south. So um, we looking further at the data. So looking further at the data, we found that 75% of the jobs within the Central Valley Motherload South were expected to see positive growth, which was faster than the four regions that we looked at overall. And we found that 80% of the examined occupations earned a living wage at the entry level. Now, again, that wage at that time was $12.28 an hour. And now when we looked at it again, and I'll show some more current data, because we all know um, we had a big elephant in the room happen um, event uh, with COVID. So we wanted to look and see how those jobs change over time. And I'll show you that data. But now that living wage is $16.41. And we use the highest wage in the highest county in the, um, in that re in the region that we examined, which was Mono County. Um, a, a big note on living wage. Um, it is basically all it really describes is a baseline uh, a baseline between self-sustainability and, um, and needing government assistance. So this wage really includes no savings, no vacation, no student loans, no entertainment. So um, it really is just straws lying in sand between the working poor and needing assistance. So, um, and over the last, and we really examined uh, the MIT's methodology, it looks like they had a big methodology update in uh, last year. So they went up to 1641 now. So looking at some more key findings, we found that over the three-year projection period, there were 42,000 annual job openings within this region, or about 50% of the annual job openings when we looked at all four uh, areas combined. So this is a significant portion of the annual job openings. Um, and, and then when we looked at all four subregions. Um, but only when we looked at the awards data, we found that the area was only awarding about 12,500 12, middle school credentials. So that means that only about 30% of those uh, of those jobs could potentially be filled with qualified workers. Um, and we found when we looked at the at these occupations that there were, uh, most of them, we looked at the top 50, uh, 45 of them uh, were in a deficit, meaning that there were more annual job openings than there were potentially credential workers. But we did find that five of the occupations did have a surplus, and those were medical assistants, dental assistants, police and sheriffs, um, heating, air conditioning, and HVAC workers, and pharmacy techs, meaning that those, those, they were awarding more credentials in those programs than there were annual job openings for those occupations. So here is a look at the top, just the top 10 occupations. The full list of the, the occupations is available in the packet that you received pr prior to this meeting. So in, let's see. So we'll switch over and we'll show the, the data for these occupations. Great. Okay, so number one here is office clerks. Here's an example of the data works. Office clerks, they're expected to have two, uh, just 2,200 annual job openings um, each year during the projection period that we looked at. And when we looked at the programs that align to that occupation, we found 330 awards, meaning that there was a deficit of just under 1,900 jobs that potentially could not be filled because there was not enough qualified workers. And when we looked at the entry level wage occupations, 
uh, we found that uh, the entry level wage, meaning the 25th percentile for this occupation, this particular occupation was $12.06 per hour. It was below the living wage standard for this occupation. Um, now, it's always good to look at the data because our, our the report also shows the median and the experience level wage. So potentially, if a worker enters this occupation, uh, over time, they could potentially earn um, they could potentially earn uh, a wage that would exceed the living wage standard for the region, or if there's a, um, you know, there, an, empo an employee can potentially enter this occupation at a higher wage. It all depends on what the, uh, what the employer is willing to pay for this occupation, but these are general statistics. So um, because of COVID-19, we didn't want to just leave the data as is. We know that um, a big event happened. Um, during over the last year. So we wanted to look at the updated data and see if anything changed over that time. So in this particular look, we looked at, um, this one includes the top 12 actually, um, but we wanted to see what big changes there were. So what we look at, what we're looking at here, um, now tractor trailer truck drivers was the number one occupation in the region, likely because there was a big boost in the need for workers to transport goods because we relied on, um, on, uh, on those goods being delivered to our house. So um, that became the number one occupation. And what this number represents in the bracket is the increase that we, from, uh, from now to what we saw in the, previous, uh, in the previous study. So this one has the annual job openings increased by 162. Uh, we looked at the awards. So there was somebody offering awards within this program. And then, the, and then we updated the deficit. And we also reviewed the entry level wages for this occupation. And what the what the uh, the wage column shows is the new that new living wage that we saw for the county, which is sixteen forty one per hour, and if the entry level wage meets that meets that um, that criteria, and the way and the wage in the bracket means how much the wage changed between the previous study and the current study. So we saw we saw a lot of increases, uh, tractor truck drivers in particular. We saw a decrease in wages in entry level wages for that occupation. But looking at the general office clerks, we saw an a dollar six increase, but still does not meet the living wage criteria that was just updated. Um, some if you if you when you get this presentation, take a look at it. You'll see that some of the occupations shuffled around uh, because the demand changed a little bit. Um, in particular, we saw um, a new occupation pop in: farmers, ranchers and other agricultural managers. This occupation in particular had a boost in the, um, the need for the type of education requirement um, and increased. So um, it made the middle school criteria this time. Uh, nursing assistants moved down off this list down to number 14. Uh, child care workers did not previously have a surplus, but now had a surplus in, in this particular uh, uh, updated study. And um, again, we updated that MIT living wage methodology. So that just gives us a sneak peek on how the labor market has changed uh, since the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, this is a good opportunity to introduce my, uh, my colleague, Nora Serenello, who will take us through the next section. And to give you that, and when you, as you look through the data um, packet that you were sent, um, it's a good opportunity to um, definitely connect with her and get the latest information that's available for your area. So our students can find gainful employment and our employers can find qualified workers. So now I will introduce my amazing colleague, uh, Nora Serenello, and uh, she Thanks. represents your area. You know her very well. And also my colleague, uh, Sarah Phillips from North Far North will help out. Thanks so much, Michael. I, I appreciate it, um, that introduction. Um, uh, yes, again, I reiterate, I am Nora Serranello, and I am the director for the Central Valley Mother Load Center of Excellence. I'm hosted at Modesto Junior College, and as most of you know me, you know that I love, love facts and data, and just um, always, always get excited to talk about it. I know it's the most thrilling thing in the world for all of us to discuss. Um, and as Michael has demonstrated, the Centers of Excellence are are very experienced with labor market information and are considered experts in our field. Um, just briefly, our primary function is to provide quality labor market data and information to help the community colleges in our areas respond to local workforce needs. Um, we do this by providing labor market reports to help align a pro programs with employer needs. Um, and we also produce many other types of reports and infographics, things like that. 
Um, we also provide on-call data to support um, grants or other investments, either funded through the state or perhaps opportunities coming from private or federal um, resources. Um, we facilitate workshops as well as support workshops like this one. Um, our workshops generally teach people how to use labor market information or just define what that actually is. We also, as a team of Centers of Excellence Directors, collaborate on development of data tools and dashboards to just make accessing LMI labor market information easier for all of our constituencies. Um, finally, we serve as research advisors to local uh, regional educational institutions, workforce agencies, and other community partners uh, that we have across the state. Um, and with the Central Valley Model Load is actually the largest region in the state, um, ha encompassing 56,000 square miles. It is a 15 county region that is bordered in the north by Alpine, Amador, and San Joaquin counties. Um, the Sierra Nevadas on the east, the Tehachapi's at its south at the southern border, and then the Diablo Range is our western border. And I have to say that I do really do love this region. I feel it has so much to give, so many wonderful and unique aspects. I mean, uh, we have the Yosemite Valley and, uh, you know, the Sierra Nevadas in general. Um, I don't know how many of you have driven down Blood Alley, as we like to call it, um, Highway 99 in the spring, but the poppies that bloom are just in a, a sight to behold. And I recommend that someone, that if you have never done that, please do it. I just think it's wonderful. And just not to mention, we are the breadbasket of the world, the Central Valley is. It's been referred uh, that way for a very long time. And I just wanna, say that I, I'm really dedicated to this region. I just want to be a conduit for upward social and economic mobility and just contribute to the general well-being of our communities, both currently and in the future. Um, and we at the Centers of Excellence do acknowledge and understand the differences between the valley floor and the mother load economies. Um, they are, they are, have sharp differences, as well as the differences between the north and the south. And I will say that, that Dave Teasdale had brought up the study about Fresno being the, you know, ha, ha, being uh, the top in the nation as, you know, in growing. But I also know that uh, the Northern Valley is also experiencing a real boon um, in, in, in construction and housing development. Um, I don't know exactly what those numbers are, but uh, I intend to look into to see what the comparison actually is. Um, and back to why we're here now that, that we really need your feedback. It's very valuable to us in order to figure out, you know, or get from you, what are you seeing or experiencing as a result of COVID-19? The changes, do you think the changes that we've seen, are they permanent? Or do you think it, we're going to end up going back to the pre-pandemic um, level of jobs and businesses. And I just, I put that question out to you to think about those questions. And if, uh, if someone would like to respond and, and begin our group conversation on what you all are seeing and experiencing, I just appreciate some feedback. Well, what I've found with uh, the industry partners that uh, I've been working with, uh, both in my uh, district job and my regional job, is the manufacturers and the uh, distribution centers um, that are prevalent in the South Valley uh, have uh, seen an uptick in demand uh, for their, and, and thus an, a need for additional uh, staffing. Um, I've also noticed that the uh, the restaurant uh, industry down here is really struggling to replace people who uh, had been put on the sidelines at the beginning of the pandemic. And now that they're uh, reopening, 
they're having challenges uh, getting people to fill those uh, food service positions. And I brought this up with the, the Northern one. Um, we, we talked about the housing boom and the people uh, leaving some of the population centers and realizing that they can get more house out here in the Valley. Um, and so that's an, another phenomenon we're gonna have of uh, people whose job may be in LA Orange County uh, or over at the coast or in the Bay Area um, living here and working remotely. And that's just gonna exacerbate the, the uh, demand for services um, while the, and, and, and that adds a question. So where does their job show up in a labor market study? If they're working for mm -hmm. Salesforce um, out of San Francisco, uh, is that a job in San Francisco or is that a job in Bakersfield if they're getting to do uh, remote work? Do you want me to answer? Yeah, that? that's a very <laughs> important point. Do you want me to answer that? <laughs> How that's how that's uh, how that works. So um, if it is if it is a remote job, and a good example to think of is um, is construction work, right? So construction workers, once they're done with the project, they move around. Sometimes they move out of county, and they continue to work and they continue to earn wages, but they may not be working in the county that they live in. So it's the same thing with remote workers. They um, they may be their job is housed in one area, but they may live somewhere else. So to answer your question, the most simple manner is that their job is counted where it is located. So if it's a if it's a job in uh, San Francisco, that job would no matter where the person lives in the country or world, that job would be counted in San Francisco. So um, there might be other things that come in uh, into play that take longer to study, um, but there there would eventually be studies that would show um, what types of workers live in certain counties. So, um, and there's, there's kind of a, there's a disconnect between those two, um, but there, there would eventually be a census of where, what types of workers live in certain areas. They may not necessarily, their job may not necessarily be counted there. So Michael, what I yeah, think I I you're saying is that there's right now, it, it won't accurately portray sort of who's working where, but um, you're saying that <clears throat> there may be some studies that will help capture that disconnect. Yeah, so the, I, I, the, the, current, the current labor market data will show uh, where the job, where it is located. Um, but later on in, in something like the current population survey, you'll eventually have a count of the types of jobs that are, that are located in certain areas. Yeah, and I just want to dovetail on that, that, that especially with the construction industry. Um, you're, it's, it's more connected to where the employer is housed because you may be working, your employer may be in San Joaquin County, but the job that they're doing is down in Stanislaus County, but the check will come out of San Joaquin County. It's just, it's the difference between, you know, the location of the employer and the work versus um, the location of the job versus the, uh, where the person lives. And those have always, you know, those have always been a part of labor market information. And we generally attempt to capture all of that. Um, I've done some studies, uh, what we call computer com, commuter pattern studies, and that actually is what contributes to the way we've organized the northern region and the southern region. Uh, those organizations are a direct reflection of where people go to either work or um, receive higher education. Um, with the pandemic, I will say that that alters things in the sense that you can stay at home and learn online or do your work online. So that, that will have to be further fleshed out, I believe, as we progress um, through these, these new changes. And again, is this going to re be permanent, do we think? Or do we think it's going to return uh, back to uh, what we call pre-pandemic levels or the way occupations are organized and people will return to driving to work? I would be inclined to think that considering environmental factors, it's far better for uh, folks to telecommute than to be on the freeways. And it's not just the environmental impacts, but just the overall social and well-being of people not having to be in traffic and such things. And Nora, this is Sarah. I will add on to that regarding the commutes in our region, it becomes a weather challenge, honestly. Um, if there's snow in the mountains, 
um, you don't have the right kind of vehicle or you know caltrans hasn't been up there to plow the roads yet you can't get to call you can't get to your class very cool dave i also saw that you posted a question uh, about ipads uh so non-credit certificates show up in ipads i'll just read out uh, I have an iPads question. Do you community college non-credit certificates show up in iPads since they do not qualify for federal financial aid? So iPads reports all uh, credentials that were their students that received financial aid, but I could double check that for you to see if it does pick up the non-credit. And there's, there's just another thing I want to bring forward that I'm a couple of the prisons are closing. I know that there, there, uh, Sarah had brought that up in yesterday's call. Um, there's the, there's a prison down in Taft that, that's closing, and the one in San Joaquin County is closing. And I have some observations on what's going to happen, and and maybe some things that we need to think about uh, in terms of retraining, um, you know, the the staff. Um, but I'm wondering if, if what rumblings you all are hearing, especially you, Karina, um, about how what's going to happen in relation to the closing of that that prison facility. Well, we actually had two prisons closed. We had a federal prison and a, um, a local prison that have both shut down. And we actually were lucky enough to have Kevin McCarthy speak at the last uh, Taft Chamber sit and sip where he was able to, because that's what people were saying is what are we going to do? Because a number of people had moved here to Taft because of that job. And so unfortunately, we're thinking that we are going to be losing some population also as, as you know, when, when the rumors started going out, people were already looking for jobs elsewhere and, and they were able to actually resign prior to the shutdown. So, um, and now they're talking about shutting down the oil fields because things like the Keystone Pipeline and, and those regulations. And we have an oil academy, uh, a lighthouse academy here in Taft that is associated with the oil fields. And so um, it's actually kind of scary all over regarding the pathways that are offered in this little area and where are these young students gonna go? Because it is about a 40 minute drive from our area to the Bakersfield area on Highway 119, which um, can cause some problems in that it is a, a high traffic flow for the oil fields out here on 119. And so uh, we, you know, a few years ago, we had five nursing students that were all killed on 119 going from Taft to Bakersfield uh, because of slippery weather. Uh, and so right now we don't know what's gonna happen. You know, we're, we're hopeful, but uh, the jobs are very limited in this area out here. So a number of people are, are having to go to Bakersfield to work and it adds a, a little bit more stress out here. But at the same time, more students are deciding to go to Taft College and trying to get certifications through um, an adult program, which offers certifications versus the AA so that they can get right into a field. So yeah, things are such up, so up in the air here, we, we just don't know what to do. And I hear, I hear you saying that that's, you know, largely to do with um, the closures of the prisons and, um, but, but is there any, and do you see that as related to pandemic or are there any other pandemic impacts? Not necessarily out here because we're kind of in the middle or on the side of ag. So we have an ag, we have two ag pathways. Those have not been affected. We have a, a transportation pathway. Well, of course that one wasn't very affected either through the pandemic. The, the ones that were hit hard were retail. However, in our small community, a lot of things didn't shut down. As soon as they had the opportunity to open back up, they were open. So our, our culinary, our retail pathways there are still those opportunities. In fact, we've got three new stores opening now here in our area, which is going to offer a number of jobs to our young people. So, so the pandemic didn't hurt us like it hurt other areas.
So does anyone have any other observations about um, that they would, would be willing to share about the impact of the pandemic um, on their local area and um, whether they believe it's going to return or is this the new normal as is been coined? Okay, hey Mary, I think that we, we've um, gleaned as much as we can on this. Um, we can go ahead and move forward to our, our next slide. So um, we were, yeah, so we were going to um, go into a breakout, but as I mentioned, we're not going to do that. And I'm having a hard time forwarding to, there we go. So, um, so um, Francis, could you please post in the chat the questions that we um, had for the breakout group? And so I'll read them out loud, and then Nora, you can lead a discussion about this. But um, you know, we were talking about the data. We're sort of referring to the data that was in the handout, and also the data that Michael shared with you. Um, was there anything that you saw there that kind of surprised you, or that didn't make sense? Um, and then we'd love your thoughts on the factors that could could can, that contribute to the occupational supply and demand gaps. You've already brought up a couple of them and I'd love to hear more about that and dig a little bit deeper. And then I'd really be interested in hearing about any strategies that you and your partners have, um, have engaged in to help minimize the gap or anything that you've heard of that's not even in this region um, that might help um, think through some opportunities for how to, um, kind of uh, uh, close that gap. So Nora, do you wanna lead the conversation? Um, well, essentially there are some strategies that I've heard that, that I said this yesterday, Delta College um, is actually put a million dollars up and they got the San Joaquin County to match it with two million, and they just did a press release day before yesterday that now they are offering um, employers internship funds to the tune of three million dollars, and it involves some some uh, you know agreement on the part of the employer to participate in a 12-week program, and there there are other details, but I think that's a good a good start for a college because there's so many small businesses who really can't afford. Um, to, to hire someone and then train them um, or, or pay for the internship and to be able to partner with a community college to ensure that the, the student is, is, not, is not only getting on the job, they're receiving training, classroom training, but they're also receiving on the job you know, experience that they need to fill out their resume is a really fantastic opportunity. And so that's that's one strategy that I've actually heard of. I've also know that Cass College, I've had several conversations with them about kind of um, moving away. You know, they have folks that are that have left the prison system; they're closed, but that they still have certain skill sets. They and and that perhaps they can um, get some upskilling, some certifications in in relation to community health services or you know disability services mental health services so that they can take take advantage of what they have in their background but also fill it out so that they're they are more in a in um a community sir a different type of community service role instead of community you know being a police officer perhaps you're a counselor and and you've interacted with there's a lot of folks that are coming out of those prisons that, that probably are going to need um counseling and you know 
in, in many different aspects, whether, you know, should they go to college? Where can they get a job? And just to know, already knowing someone, we always assume they're adversarial, or we don't always, some people assume there's adversarial relationships, but I know some uh, corrections officers and they, um, and that have worked in the prisons and it's more like they're still part of a community together. And so there's some things that could be done to take advantage of those existing relationships to help those that are coming out of an inmate population to reenter um, the general population in a positive way. And, and to turn things that perhaps were once negative positive, I guess I would say it that way. Nora, this is Sarah. And as I talked about yesterday um, a little bit, one of our big um, California correctional facilities in Lassen County is also closing. Um, I'm wondering how much, or if at all, credit for prior learning is being addressed in your region, um, not only for the inmates or the our formerly what will who will be our formerly incarcerated folks, but for also for the people who are working in those correctional facilities right now. Is there have you explored that um, kind of avenue in your region? Um, I know that uh, Bakersfield College is really putting a lot of effort behind credit for prior learning. I don't know how much they're doing that with the corrections officers. Uh, they're doing that, that um, in their inmate scholar program. I know West Hills uh, uh, College, uh, both Kalinga and Lemoore, um, have a vibrant credit for prior learning uh, approach. So it is something that uh, there is awareness uh, I can't speak for uh, Porterville, even though it's in our district, or College of Sequoias, um, in terms of how uh, how far they are with that process. I had a so what I see from the data is I I, I need more detail. One of the challenges I have with the SOC codes and the Bureau of Labor Statistics, like that maintenance and repair worker general, where we have no supply for that demand is I need to know a little bit more from the employers about how they're filling that need. Uh, and it may be that they're, that the way the employers are working, that there's a uh, uh, SOC code misalignment in terms of how they're filling that. So if somebody had some basic construction or basic electrical or basic plumbing, they may be in the maintenance of repair worker general, but not be showing up as supply, but they may be getting a certificate that and then moving into that job because it it has a, you know such a broad thing. Um, same with the tr uh, truck driving. I'm wondering if some of the supply is being supplied by non uh, federal financial aid in institutions. Um, so I, that, I think that would be interesting. I know um, Bakersfield College is a lead for a regional high roads training uh, partnership grant with the state, and that's part of what it, what it is is to engage with the employers to determine um, more specifics in terms of skill sets that they are having challenges filling in the area. That's uh, that's great feedback, Dave. Uh, to address the, the first part with the track show of truck drivers, uh, we found that they're in, in particularly my area, there's a very high need for those occupations and we have trucks everywhere. So clearly somebody is filling those jobs some way, somehow. Uh, we found that the employers tend to have um, training programs to address their need, even though they still have that pain of we still need more workers than ever. Um, so we, you know, we explored that area to see if that was feasible to do. And we found for many factors that it just wasn't feasible to build that type of program. But because um, we do want to report all the available jobs and the jobs that do pay well within the region, we still report that this is a job that's in demand and, it, and we know it's still in demand. Um, and we, and West Hills Kalinga actually has a, a truck driving program, and I don't know if their supply is, is uh, showing in there. But yeah, that's an expensive yeah. program it's, to prop up. There's there's challenges at, at the institutional level, so it's it's not just hey, let's just build this program. You know, when you finally do get a truck, it's like we got to buy the truck, which is not cheap. We got to insure the truck. We've got to store the truck. We got to maintain the truck. Then we got to find the instructor. So we do know that there's there's a a bigger issue. And what this really is is that's the this, think of this report is like a star map saying like, hey, here's an opportunity to go to, and then for the colleges to further explore if that opportunity is um, 
it's 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 feasible within the, within the constraints that we have at the at, at public institutions. And uh, and as far as your other uh, in the second part, uh, the maintenance workers, you you may be totally right that they're finding people who have certain skill sets like welders or electricians to fill those occupations because those are literally uh, KSAs are involved with that type of occupation. Um, but are they finding people that um, are, are they just filling the job because they need to fill the job or are they finding the most the most well qualified people and um, something else about the about that alignment between SIP uh, cross classification instructional program same thing same problem we have a top um, that we right. use the California community college system um, and the SOC alignment is that um, they're, they're like the most likely connection between the two uh, for example if you take a nursing program you are probably going to be a nurse but if you take a business program, what can you be? <laughs> so many different things. So, um, and then I always ask, which is the most dangerous question in groups like this, when this question comes up, I'm like, okay, raise your hand if you're working in your field of study, <laughs> which is a totally dangerous question to ask. But, um, well, but I found for the most part that most people don't work in their field of study. So, so Michael, I, uh, <laughs> yeah. I had a bachelor's degree in economics and I have the word economic in, in my title. So does that mean I'm working in my field of study? <laughs> Sure, I can argue it, but I don't think I'm an I'm not an economist right now. Yeah, yeah, I it's, love all, that it's all about how we use those. It's all how we use those skills in in whatever job that we're doing. So so help out uh, help out my buddy uh, Alan Braggins. <laughs> yep. I think this conversation about what we train for is hilarious on some levels because I remember literally like the second year of my undergrad flipping through the catalog and saying like, ah, they make, they're they making me declare a major. And I went alphabetically and was like, nope, nope, ew, blood, nope, like, ew, no, check, ew. So I landed on political science because I was like, well, I can probably do anything with this one. Um, and, you know, turns out I didn't even know there was such a thing as a center of excellence for labor market research, you know? So <laughs> I think we could do better in as a society probably of like giving our students like opportunities, but not Sarah, to talk about me, which is, you know, obviously one of my favorite things. But well, but that's a, that's a really good example. <laughs> and it's one of the things that I've been working with uh, Nora on. And so I'll just tell the whole group here. Um, I think, uh, I, I think labor market uh, KSA study, which is hard to do is, is probably going to give us more clarity that way. I was looking at the office clerk ones and we know that we have a, a, a huge number of skill builders in the community college. So they went and they took the uh, Microsoft office course and they parlayed that with good communication skills into an office position, but then show up as an office certificate, but they were prepared frequently by the community colleges for that position. And a lot of it's our, um, that's why I asked the non-credit question is we, ne we never, we just took that as a course. We never made that a uh, certificate, but now there are non-credit certificates in, you know, Excel and Word and, and things that are skills that are, are, are valued uh, out there. And um, so that's, I'm, I've been working with, with Nora and trying to get at that because a lot of my, in the energy construction utility and in Gary's uh, uh, manufacturing with the maintenance mechanics, a lot of times it's not a program, it's a set of skills and, and knowledge and abilities that uh, lead to that job. You're not good, you know, uh, the uh, ag mechanic and a building maintenance person <laughs> and a manufacturing maintenance person, that's not the same job, but they have a lot of transferable skills. Absolutely. Exactly. David. Yeah. I just shared um, earlier, I shared a link to a New York Times article that just came out, um, which may give us some indication of how young people are using their skills and, um, and not doing the traditional work path. You know, they're like, I've learned a lot during this pandemic that I just think that going to work and uh, doing the normal thing, saving for retirement, is not the normal path. They're taking their skills and, and treating it like a, um, as the young people say, the YOLO <laughs> the yellow type economy. I'm going to take my skills. I'm going to do whatever I can. So it's, it's actually a really interesting read and it's, it's just one person's perspective, but I thought it was really cool. Cool. Yeah. And, and technology skills are very valuable. That, that those have become critical in just being able to do this call, do uh, operate zoom, 
important component to function in this, uh, well, in the pandemic and, and still for us. So, Nora, please interrupt me if this is derailing this conversation at all. But again, I'm, my region is facing a prison closure as well. So I'm very curious about anyone's thoughts. <laughs> Up here, it's at least a thousand people in a very small community who are going to lose their jobs. And I'll say that again, because it's really hard to get your head around unless you're up here, like a thousand people in a community where 30,000 people live. I mean, I can't try to extrapolate the impact right on the community. So and you, it sounds like are experiencing similar things. Like, what are you guys doing? Like, what have you, have you had community, like contact with those facilities? Um, like, what do we do? <laughs> um, and maybe Nora, again, not stepping on toes or not trying not to step on your toes. Can we have some like crazy idea? Like, hey, electric vehicles are coming down the pike, like Tesla. Do you want these facilities? <laughs> like, can we get crazy and think about what to do around here? Or, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> this is what happens to me late in the day is I start asking crazy questions. So mute me anytime. But I really am curious about your feedback on this one. No, I think I, uh, yeah, what do we do with those facilities and, you know, what is what are folks going to do? And and we know that as the pointed out in uh, the facts portion of this is that we have, you know, high demand and low supply in some very important areas, and um, you know, in very important occupations. Um, how do we how do we get our community members into programs where they can acquire those skills they need in order to fill these uh, positions that are, that we already have in existence um, and uh, that, that pay a living wage. So that to me is, the, the, and of course, utilization of the facility is, is I love that you're talking about electric vehicles. Um, you know, we're had we and and there's things in relation to the environment in the valley that we need to be thinking about long term, um, on how we're utilizing our land and our water and you know and of course in the north the fire mitigation. But really, we have these existing occupations at this point that we don't have an, enough supply for. How do we how do we strategize? How do we work together in getting? our community members into, in, into those jobs, you know, uh, educate, you know, give them the skill sets they need, the education they need to be successful applicants. But if anybody has some, you know what, Sarah's question, I, I, I like it. And that, you know, what do we do with these large facilities um, that maybe there is some, but there again, we're gonna create even more demand <laughs> if we you know if we find a what to do with the facility that's wonderful um but we're going to increase our demand we need to increase the people that are able to fill the number of people who are qualified to fill these occupations and get them into them and gary you haven't i'm going to call you out you haven't said much but you're the advanced manufacturing person and very on it with uh, automation and artificial intelligence do you have any thoughts on what we've been discussing uh as far as transforming uh prisons into uh facilities um man the, the buildings there the opportunities there i know uh the data is kind of weird as far as it's showing for living wages uh i know uh, most uh manufacturers that i've talked to or most automation companies uh they're for for regular maintenance mechanic uh you, they're looking at like fifty thousand a year so that's a little more than that thirteen dollars an hour that fifteen dollars an hour that the data showed um just just starting off and so uh, after they finish a program but like dave was saying uh you know with with some of these programs being not for credit uh as far as trainings go 
you know, are, is the data really picking up uh, those students when they complete? Uh, but, you know, just doing some additional training, because the jobs are there. All, all we hear is we can't get enough employees. And so figuring out maybe some converting those facilities into regional training centers or, um, you know, different types of hubs like that, innovation hubs, uh, maybe that will work uh, and upskilling some of those um, employees of those facilities to be able to either stay at those facilities or, or educate others. Gary, do you know either anecdotally or through data why those positions are hard to fill right now? Um, not enough students. I think uh, there's definitely one of the things I've been working on is uh, secondary awareness, secondary education awareness. Uh, I come from the secondary system and students aren't aware of the, the potential that these uh, uh, careers have. So, you know, they, when, they, when they're growing, you know, when you're a kid, you know what a doctor does, kind of, right? You kind of know what a lawyer does. Um, and so, but who knows what a, you know, automation technician is, right? Unless, you know, a parent or someone is kind of in that business, right? What, what is an HMI or, or some of these other um, components for automation? So uh, I, I've been working with a lot of uh, secondary educators on uh, upskilling them because they don't know either uh, some of these positions uh, are available. So upskilling them so they're able to give students more awareness of the opportunities. And then when they do come to community college, um, then that pipeline is better established. Uh, you could get, you know, a year and a half certification or even a, a two-year associates, and you can make, you know, 70000 a year, um, and, and the jobs are there. You know, you go through a four-year apprenticeship program, and you know, you're making 70000 a year, or you go through uh, Baker Sills bachelor's program for automation tech, and you're, you're probably up closer to the, the 80, 90000 a year, so... Um, just not enough students. When, when the programs are only getting 10, 15 students, uh, uh, a cohort, it's, it's when you have thousands of positions open, it's, companies are stealing from other companies and that's how some of these positions are, are getting filled. Uh, Gary, thank you for that insight, actually. Um, I've been looking for that research forever, by the way, how students, uh, secondary students, high school students, um, their awareness of the types of jobs out there, because I agree, like I want to be a YouTube star, a uh, sports star, you know, those really sexy occupations and they don't know what those, the, those are those dirty jobs that, so to speak, that where they can really earn the money. Um, we, we watch a lot of Blippi <laughs> in our house. Um, I have some <laughs> ones and it Blippi makes like 17 million a year. So um, just off of YouTube, I mean, <laughs> there it's, you that, <laughs> it's there, the money's there. The money's there, but not everybody's gonna be a, is it Blippi? <laughs> it's not going to be a blippy, right? Yeah, everybody's so, going to be a blippy. <laughs> so, yeah. um, how do you raise awareness with the with the secondary students about these types of jobs? Like, hey, um, you could go do that, and I would always tell people go follow your passion up to a certain point. But uh, you know, if it doesn't work out, these are the types of jobs you could take in, right here in your neighborhood that lead to that that living wage and self sustainability. How do you raise awareness with those students? Yeah, I think it starts with the teachers because when you think about how a teacher, a traditional teacher is, um, you know, employed, right? They they go through a high school program that kind of gives them. So say for an ag teacher, agricultural teacher, right? So they go through an ag program in high school and they're like, hey, I really like this. Maybe I want to be an ag teacher, right? They they'll go to a two year and they transfer to four year. Uh, they get their bachelor's degree and now they're a subject matter expert in the area of animal science, ag mechanics, whatever the case may be, and then now they're a teacher. How much real life experience do they have in the industry? They really don't have any. And so to, they don't know what is out there. So they only know their experience and that's what they project on their students. And it's this rotating cycle of really not knowing, you know, and so I think starting with teachers and educating teachers on the, the various uh, parts of the industry, and then, you know, the, the industry engagement piece with uh, their advisory committee, 
uh, could could be stronger, but that's on on that end. But um, yeah, just uh, giving students uh, more awareness from the teacher, and then uh, then kind of sparking that interest of the changes of industry. Yeah. How how about in the area with uh, informing their their parents as well? Yeah, I think so. I think uh, mm -hmm. you know because you know when you when you think of manufacturing, you think of somebody in a dirty environment, and not really in a clean environment, right? When you you don't think about manufacturing as food processing, right? In a clean state, or or you know robotics or or medical grade type manufacturing. So there's uh, you know high tech and low tech manufacturing, and you know and skill level for the and so educating parents as well. Absolutely. Well, you know, in yesterday's conversation, Blaine brought up um, the fact that, you know, there's a level of disservice, there's lack of a better um, reiteration of what he says that we, you know, we, left, we leave our young people out frequently, leading them to the path to a four-year degree and not really informing them about how much money they can make in a CTE, a vocational program, and that um, we really need to, to ramp up uh, advertisement of our of CTE programs and what students can actually make uh, just getting uh, some vocational, just getting voca skilled vocationally and, and that how useful that is. Instead of just always touting the, hey, we need to go to the four year, you need to get your four year. Yes, you know, that's in the long run, that's a good idea. And I fully believe that we shouldn't just uh, put students on dead end pathways, but we need to open that door so that they can, because a lot of our students just can't go full time for a year, can't afford it. In this Central Valley, that a lot of young people have to support their, their parents or they have children or little brothers and sisters. And so it's kind of this, this on, on ramping, on off ramping, Kathy Booth talked about this for a long time when she used to present all the time that we, you know, we have to be flexible and actually be really rounded in the offerings that parents and students are aware of so they can take care of themselves, their families, as they enter and exit, enter and exit their edu educational path. But again, I want to reiterate, we don't want to put them on a path to where they've got to start all over if they find, decide to jump to a four year, that we need to keep the math you know, the math in place and the English in place. I know I'm on a pill, you know, up on a soapbox now, but I full, fully support that we want to keep those, those pathways open if eventually people as they get older um, can need to move uh, out of more from more physical work into more um, less taxing, less physically demanding work. Now going off kind of what, what you know Nora is saying is how many how many educators and administrators, especially at the secondary level, come from vocational from the vocational field versus the academia field, and so you kind of kind of push your your bias, right? Most of those administrators have uh, you know post bachelor's degree, right? They have graduate degrees or even some PhD. So when you're you know, counselor, and you have your experiences to be successful that you came from, you know, because you've got a bachelor's degree or a master's degree, you're kind of going to push that on, on your on students, rather than kind of pushing them in the way of, you know, vocational studies. I think, Gary, to that point, you know, this whole recognition and push for first generation college students um, has been in my opinion, very much focused on first generation to go to a four year college like it's okay like to go to a two year college and still be first generation in that and I don't know that that has been scooped up. Um, in the marketing, but that may also just be maybe more in the far north region. Well, yeah, I, I, I agree with you know pushing. For first generation college student, I I was one of those first generation college students. Uh, my parents, so even my siblings, still haven't uh, been to college. Uh, they they've done the vocad thing, um, a couple of them went to the military and whatnot. But um, 
you know, and, and been unfamiliar with that that transition, you know, or, or that path kind of put myself in a bind uh, with with student loans and whatnot. So, you know, it's it's okay to go to community college, right? And and be a first generation college student. You know, but we're we're pushing for for four year degrees rather than two year opportunities. Yeah, I agree. I was first generation college student too, and I, my husband and I are still paying off our student loans. <laughs> well, I, I will say this in a personal note. I got I have quite a few um, siblings, and both my parents are from higher education, um, and to this day, my mother. Uh, I was talking to Michael about this the other day is that she's got money for my grandchildren to go to college, but her requirement is that they need to, they have to start at a community college because she's not going to, she doesn't want to waste money on paying for an education that's not going to be used. It, that she feels the community college is the perfect place for uh, students to figure out who they really are and to mature as people, as human beings, so that they, so that they, when they eventually, if they eventually jump to a four year or higher, they're far more prepared. And it's statistically, you know that folks coming out of community colleges are far more successful in, in their, high, their upper education, uh, their bachelor's, master's, and PhDs than those who enter straight from high school. So I wonder if um, there are any last um, comments or thoughts about, um, you know, along the same lines that we've been talking about. I think the next um, thing to discuss really, Nora, is um, next steps. So where do you want to go from here um, in terms of, you know, what you're already doing and how can people engage and partner together uh, regionally? Well, most of those that are here on the call now are already a part of the Central Region Consortium, um, if not all of them. And we are just going to continue to reach out to our partners in terms of our, our pathway coordinators, our K through 12, in our K through 12, our um, local industry, and um, getting feedback from them on what their actual needs are and then further educating our public as that Gary and, and was talking about in terms of what the benefits are of, you know, a community college education and the need for skill building. And so that's what I see. And I would say that if anybody's on the call that I'm not seeing, who's not a part of the region, you can reach me um, through the COE website, Centers of Excellence, coeccc.net or email, or um, you can contact anyone that's been on this uh, webinar and they can direct you back to me. And I'm easy to locate. I'm at Modesto Junior College, Modesto, California. And my email is serenellon at mjc.edu. Thank you so much, Nora. Laura, I wonder, do you wanna bring us home? Sure, yeah, so um, much of this work in the webinar today were based on these references. Again, you'll be receiving um, the slides which include uh, this reference page if you would like to dig a little bit deeper. I also wanna note that uh, we were recording and I'm gonna go ahead and stop that now.